I want to introduce our speaker, Bill Bullock. He's from Memphis, Tennessee. I've got him listed as a volunteer, but he's going to tell us more about himself. And he is going to, he's the one that basically helped organize and coordinated a very successful effort to uh, address the invasive problem at a public park. So Bill, I'm gonna turn it over to you and uh, tell us who you are. Sure, I think I will attempt to share screen now. How are we doing? Does that seem to work? Yep, it's perfect. Great. So uh, thank you, Neil. It's, it's great to be uh, talking with this group. Um, so I had a very, a very good 35-year career with the utility company here in Memphis. I was an engineer, uh, and uh, I like to kind of start out because this topic that I'm talking on is not something I had experience with until just the last few years. Um, uh, and I will say this is the way I got started. I was, uh, my mom was probably a big influence on me. She was a big bird watcher, uh, amateur bird watcher here. And, and when I grew up, we always were kind of taught, you know, let's identify the snakes and the butterflies and the in the birds and in the trees and the flowers and everything like that. Mom always made me look up words in the dictionary if I didn't know it. So she's got had a lot of influence on me. And in Memphis, a number of years ago, the Wolf River Conservancy was started. And mom was a uh, initial member of that group. And uh, I got involved a little bit over time as well. And uh, in deep into my career at MLGW, I saw some overlap where uh, the Conservancy is really looking after the watershed in the uh, Wolf River, a really cool river here and mostly in Shelby County, but it also extends to the east or its, its uh, origins are to the east and to the south. Uh, they want to protect the watershed. Memphis Light Gas and Water pumps water, drinking water, out of the, what's called the Memphis Sands Aquifer. Part of that aquifer is recharged from the Wolf River, and I was a big proponent of the conservancy. And uh, quite frankly, I would say that the, that aquifer is one of Memphis' greatest assets because it's a huge amount of very pure, clean water. So I figured it's a no-brainer for my company that it's produces, it pumps out, and sells this water to, to participate. But I was told, no, we cannot do that financially. We can't take our ratepayer money and do anything to help the Conservancy come up with another idea. So a smart young man with the Conservancy named Ryan Hall got back with me after I suggested something else. And he gave a long list of things to do. But one of the things he mentioned was replant the MLGW transmission right-of-way in Kennedy Park with native species. And I absolutely did not really understand what he was talking about. So what I began is this is where my learning curve started. And I began trying to understand or began understanding and learning all about uh, native plants relative to non-native plants and why it was important. Uh, we actually, in Kennedy Park, there's about a mile of transmission right of way right through some forested areas. Uh, they also cross the Wolf River, so they're definitely in, the, in that uh, watershed. And MLGW did what many utility companies do, and that's Memphis Light, Gas, and Water, uh, and that is you either mow it or kill it. And that will keep the main thing that they want is they don't want trees growing up into uh, the right-of-way. Uh, so I started learning, and I made a pitch uh, to MLGW. Uh, and uh, there's benefits to MLGW there. I think there was going to be some ecological benefits. And my thought was this was going to be a beautiful meadow of flowering plants that's just everyone's going to ooh and ah over. Well, they mollified me and gave me a few thousand dollars out of the multi million dollar. Uh, 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 tree trimming budget to, to let me have my way with this little piece of land. And uh, it was most thought, thought that since this was not my area, 
uh, I shouldn't be there anyway. But I started working with it and I ended up, uh, as you could see in that, in that slide, there's a farmer that I hired to use a seed drill uh, to plant uh, seeds. I got with round stone seed out of Kentucky. First had a mix of about 80 or 90 seeds that was just beautiful until I got the price tag on it. And then I pared it down to about a dozen native grasses and a few more than that on the wildflowers uh, to plant. And uh, those, what I, what I learned as I went through this is we're really not gonna end up necessarily with a beautiful, colorful meadow. We're gonna have a pretty wild area that's gonna be generally made up of those native grasses, which are truly the most beneficial part of it because they are big, clumping, they choke out other things, they have very deep roots, and therefore they uh, uh, do a good job of erosion control and the suppression of trees, which, the comp which MLGW needed. And that was planted about a year before I retired. And since that time, MLGW has pretty much been able to ignore it, which is a great thing. And it's, it's a pretty wild looking area now that doesn't require much maintenance by MLGW and is a great habitat for a, a, a lot of different animals, birds and insects. As I was approaching retirement, I kept seeing my friends who retired show back up at work and work part time. And uh, I asked a number of them, why are you back? And they generally said, well, I got bored. And my, my retirement was upcoming. And while I played a little music, and a little bridge, and golf, and I've got an old hundred year old house that needs a lot of work. And I like to sail and kayak a little bit. I didn't think that I would get bored, but I was beginning to worry. So I lived very close to Overton Park. It's been part of my life for, for many decades. And uh, so I went to the folks at the Conservancy and said, I'm going to retire. Is there anything that I could maybe help with? And they said, yes, uh, we really want to start ramping up our uh, efforts on invasive plants control. And that would be great, uh, a great thing for you to do. So I retired and began uh, working kind of under the wing of Eric Bridges, who's one of the direct, is a director at the Conservancy, which is a very small group of about six employees. Uh, and but he's also a forester and he's a very intelligent guy, knows a lot of things, and very fun to work with. So that's what started me on this. And so as we talk about invasive species, it's, it seems kind of obvious, but it's non-native and it does or can potentially cause harm. And uh, as you see that picture there of English ivy, one of the things that's uh, pretty, uh, pretty good areas of that in the park. So what are the problems they propose? Uh, they can outcompete the native plants for the sunlight, water, and nutrients. Something that I've learned about that Eric has been seeing over many years is they seem to change the normal path of a forest succession, whereas typically a big oak tree falls in a rural forest. Uh, and then probably things like uh, elderberry and jewelweed and, and uh, pokeweed and then uh, sweet gum and, and box elders come up. And then finally you get your uh, other trees, your oaks, I guess, maybe hickories, tulip poplars come in and, and eventually replace what was there in the past. That was changing in Overton Park. Some of the plants may be allelopathic. We know of at least a couple that are. Uh, and then that they put some chemicals in the soil to suppress the growth of other plants. Some of them support invasive insects. And there's an example of that that we've certainly got in the forest as well. Uh, since they're not from this area and they're not native here, they have few natural enemies. Uh, birds may be attracted to their fruit, uh, but in many cases that fruit is not nutritional. And then uh, finally, they are a food desert for the native insects. And I've come to learn how important that is. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. How did they get here? Well, many of the invasives that we'll look at today are ones that me, my, the people who lived here before me and all in the neighborhood and throughout Memphis and probably for the most part, the United States, we planted them in our front yards 
because they were beautiful or what we felt was beautiful. They were often evergreen and by golly, nothing ever ate them. So they lived forever. Uh, that's how a lot of them are here. Some hitch a ride one way or the other. They didn't, they weren't intentionally introduced, but a seed or a plant or something hitched a ride somewhere else and got established. And we'll chat about that a little bit. And then some of the species that we see were brought to the U.S. for some special purpose. Uh, white mulberry was expected to be uh, great for the silk production in the United States. It didn't work out, but the mulberry is still here. Kudzu, it was brought in for erosion control. It may have done a pretty good job of that, but we all know the other problems with kudzu. Uh, polonia, I believe, was brought in to be a fast-growing tree for lumber. That didn't work out, but there's still polonia trees uh, around. So what I'm going to do is just sort of go through a list of some of the invasives that we're dealing with and give you a, a, what I know about them or what I think I know. Uh, and one of the things that I'm learning, uh, being relatively new to this, is I, I paid no attention to the scientific names of these plants for a long time because it just seemed like too much to learn. But what I have found and figured out is sometimes different people call the same plant by different names, and some people call different plants by the same name. So if you truly want to communicate well on what we're talking about, it is best to use the scientific name as well. But in this, uh, I'll pretty much say that I'll, I'll talk about the common names that we know. Privet. Uh, gee, it's the perfect plant, is it not? It, it's always green unless it gets really, really cold. You can plant it in your yard. You can trim it up like a hedge. The birds eat the berries. It smells great. But golly, have we found that it takes over a lot of territories. And we've been fighting, and I say we in the collective sense, been fighting privet for decades there. there luckily, there's been folks organized for a long time who have been working on it. It's still there, it'll always be there, but we kind of keep it suppressed through uh, uh, regular activity. Another, full, another beautiful front yard plant, Mandina. Uh, uh, beautiful red berries. What I didn't know was the berries are actually poisonous. And while typical local birds don't usually eat those berries, if you have some event like a cedar wax wings uh, uh, converging on a nearby holly tree, they begin to eat everything red and, and sort of a frenzy. And they'll find uh, dead cedar wax wings with Nandina berries in their belly. That's something that we see in the forest a good bit. Uh, the Iliagnus species, Russian olive, thorny olive, and autumn olive, uh, they are pretty aggressive and are in the park. Uh, several of those species are. They're still in landscapes now and still being planted now, especially I see them in commercial landscapes because good golly, you can't kill them. They grow fast. All you gotta do is keep them trimmed if you want to. So they are there in abundance. The beautiful leatherleaf mahonia, it's got beautiful blue berries and is in many front yards around my neighborhood. Unfortunately, it also can take hold in the forest and become pretty large and aggressive, choking other things out. What I call monkey grass, the different Lyriope species, that's a very difficult one because uh, it's uh, hard to control. It's not one you can really pull out of the ground. And if there's very big areas of it, it's very difficult to try to uh, dig it out. So uh, then there are areas in Overton Park that have a good bit of monkey grass, uh, something that we're working on trying to figure out the best methods of control. Um, kudzu. Um, that on the left is a photograph I took probably two or three years ago in the park. It is still in the park, but it is very much under control compared to what it used to be. Luckily, uh, two or more decades ago, some folks got real interested in trying to get it under control, discovered the chemical trans line, which killed very little other species in the park, if any, except for red buds. Other than kudzu, they got it under control. And the picture on the right was, is an old vine that's still hanging from a tree, or it was when I took that picture. It's a pretty significant vine. And you can see that uh, there were places in the park where kudzu overtook a number of the canopy trees in the forest. Luckily, that's very much under control, but uh, it's still a potential problem if we, and we need to keep it in check. 
I had never heard of Tree of Heaven. It's got such a beautiful name. It's Elianthus altissima uh, until I started working with Eric. On the right is a tree. Uh, it's probably about 18 inches in diameter. And uh, Eric had hacked and squirted that one. And we'll talk about that a little bit in, in a minute. Uh, but that, uh, that tree is dead. Also notice that it's got uh, a little silver tag on it. It actually is tagged and numbered. And then I guess sort of ironically right behind it is a cherry laurel growing. And we'll talk about those in a moment. Um, it happens to be the host for a horrible uh, invasive insect called the spotted lanternfly, spotted lanternfly, and that is that is bad. Uh, to me, uh, the the uh, amateur that I am, I have trouble distinguishing this tree from a few others. It looks a whole lot to me like sumac. It looks a lot like walnut. But if you can grab a leaf and tear it in two and smell it, the leaves smell like peanut butter. Now, what is the best environment for one of these trees to go, grow in? I took this picture about three days ago. I was walking in my neighborhood back past an, a building that's been abandoned for a year or so. And there's a tree of heaven happily growing out of the crack between the uh, sidewalk and the building foundation. They will grow just about anywhere. And once I have learned what they look like, they're fairly easy to spot in, a, in an area that's been unkept for a little while. They can really pop up and go to town. And I guess I would also say uh, it's allelopathic. Uh, it does suppress the growth of other um, trees. And if we had gone in and cut that tree on the right down instead of hacking and squirting it, once you stressed it like that, thousands of small tree of heavens would have emerged from the root zone, making the eradication that much harder. There is some of the vinca species in the park. Um, winter creeper is there, one of the uh, Euonymus fortunae, and someone uh, that I've been learning from in the last year or so has suggested that may be one of the worst invasives in Overton Park. It is a huge ground cover, uh, but it also can bind pretty significantly and go up trees. The only good thing about that one is often you can uproot it relatively easy when the ground is uh, soft and on that vine on the right, after I took that picture, I basically just cut the vine and I either uprooted it uh, the lower part or if I couldn't do that, I would have probably treated it with an herbicide and I'll show you those techniques in a moment. Trifoliate orange was another one that I was introduced to in the Overton Park Old Forest. Um, it's a thorny little beast, uh, two to three inch thorns, and uh, it's, uh, it's quite the barrier to keep things going through, and it can be quite large. Uh, they can easily get 10 to 15 feet tall and probably spread 20 to 25 feet in total diameter and take up a, a significant amount of the forest. It's got beautiful orange fruits. And when they fall to the ground, it seems like every one of the seeds will sprout and you get these clumps and clumps of other trifoliate oranges. So it's significant. And in its form right there, it is uh, intimidating to get in there and work with those. English holly. Um, I have a lot of experience with this because I think this made up some of the what I call the sticker bushes planted in front of my parents' house when I was a kid. And it was my job to trim them up in the form of a nice ball and they had pretty red berries in the uh, uh, in season. And uh, unfortunately though, they uh, have found a pretty good home in Overton Park as well. There is one native holly there, American holly, uh, and luckily they look significantly different. Uh, so it's easy to, uh, and that native holly is one of the very few things that's green in the winter uh, that should be there. Japanese honeysuckle uh, is, is prevalent through different areas of Overton Park and it has a tendency to wrap pretty tightly around a lot of small trees. Luckily we've kind of found if you grab it, uh, it's often these uh, kind of pencil size woody stems near the bottom, if you grab those you can often uproot it and once you do that you really suppress that growth in that area uh, and so that works pretty well. We do have coral honeysuckle in Overton Park as well, 
Unfortunately, there's a bit more Japanese than coral. And for me, I have a difficult time telling them apart when they're not in bloom. So I'm reluctant to pull much Japanese honeysuckle unless it's clearly the invasive species. Um, this uh, Ammer honeysuckle, we also call it bush honeysuckle, um, is one of the things we've been dealing with. We've had a couple of large areas with an infestation here. This is one that is definitely allelopathic in that we took out some large areas and even a year or two later, there's very little growing there uh, at present. Uh, it's probably six feet tall, a mature bush and can be easily that or more in diameter. Um, Linnea West, who's a very knowledgeable person in Memphis regarding plants, puts out different abstracts and papers and she put a paper out on Amber Honeysuckle and one of her things that she mentioned was the berries of this plant were the gumdrops of the plant world. And she further explained that they're very, very high in sugar. So birds like to eat them, but it's probably not very good for them. Uh, the migratory birds need native berries that are high in fat during their migratory seasons. And if those plants with those berries are being overtaken with some of these like amber honeysuckle or privet, um, uh, then you're really doing a disservice to the migratory birds and impacting them as well. I've had other people describe birds eating these berries as uh, uh, you and I eating dinner at the checkout aisle of the grocery store. Um, which is, might be quite tasty, but not very nutritional. Now, this is one that's different from all the others that, that are sort of on our list. Virtually every invasive plant that we deal with is from Europe or Asia. But Prunus caroliniana, as you can tell from the name, is, is a native to the US. It's not endemic here in this area, but it has been highly planted and apparently birds eat seeds and the seeds get distributed and they uh, are very quick to germinate and do quite well in the conditions that we have. Um, it's thought to be allelopathic and that's under study now by Eric Bridges as he's working on his doctoral uh, degree with uh, the forest is a significant, the old forest in Overton Park is a significant part of his laboratory and he's got some interesting experiments with cherry laurel. When I first started with Eric about six years ago, we weren't doing much with cherry laurel, but he reproduced a study in 2019 that was originally done in 1987 by Dr. Goulden. And uh, Dr. Goulden reported no cherry laurels in his quite thorough study of the forest. In 2019, Eric found that it comprised more species of trees than any other species in the forest except for the pawpaw. So since that time, we've worked with uh, the Tennessee Department uh, of Environment and Conservation, Alan Trentley, who oversees the forest. Overton Park Forest is about 130 acres of state natural area. So we need uh, guidance and permission to do the things that we do. And he agreed that there are too many cherry laurels in the forest and we began removing them. And you could really see the difference. Uh, you could see it because in the wintertime you can look in the forest and there are areas that are just bright green and it's almost 100% cherry laurel. And then a few of the other uh, uh, plants around uh, Bradford Pear, uh, I'm learning is just horrible. We've got, I'm finding more and more in the park. And unfortunately, I think that's simply because uh, they've been there all along. I'm just beginning to see them a little bit better. I'm, my eye seems to get better each year on trying to identify things. Uh, you see a few other ones there. The Japanese chaff flower is the one that's the, the ride hitcher. That is a pretty horrible invasive grass um, that I understand is wreaking some havoc in the Atlanta area 
area, but I had someone who loves the park and is in the park a good bit and was very knowledgeable point this out to me after the growing season last year. So we will be looking for that and then figuring out how best to control it as we move forward. Um, wisteria, there are, uh, there's two uh, non-native wisterias that, that are around in the area and at least one of them is in the park. Good news, it's a small section of the park. The bad news is, is it is very hard to get under control. We can certainly cut the, the vines out of the trees, but uh, we have yet to be able to, to suppress the growth uh, from the root zone. So we continue to work on that. And then one that uh, seems some sort of innocuous when I first saw it, the Italian arum, a pretty little leafy, kind of a ground cover plant. Uh, I saw some of those when I first started walking through the forest. But that's an easy one to see and notice. And I'm seeing more and more of those. It looks to me like it's beginning to sort of take off exponentially in Overton Park. So that may be a focus uh, of more concentration for our efforts in the future. So how do we control? Um, our favorite and number one thing we love to do is mechanically take it out roots and all, and uh, we do a lot of that. In some cases we can't, so there may be some chemical application uh, that's, that, that we use. And then uh, Eric kind of pointed out to me a while back that really our other focus is cultural, sort of educational. Let's educate folks on the forest, on the native aspects, on the invasive plants, and the impacts that we have on, on the environment, even on just the plants that we have planted in our own yards. So I think cultural is one of the things we're trying to do, and that's uh, educating folks as best we can as well. And that's a really fun part. That's something that I enjoy doing as well. The tools that we use uh, on the left are just some of the things in, that I carry with me. Uh, the sleeves you see there are one of my most important pieces of equipment. I used to continually get poison ivy and scratches on my wrists where my gloves and my shirt sleeves met. And once I figured out these sleeves, I've eliminated that. On the right is our favorite tool, uh, the uprooter. Uh, and those were when we just bought them and they were nice and clean and new. And uh, uh, since then, they've been well used and are not nearly that pretty, but still quite functional. And that's a favorite tool for volunteers because it's kind of fun to use. Uh, normally, we do that in the winter. I actually, uh, some of our volunteer groups, we kept going on into the spring and early summer here. And this is Rory, one of our volunteers. I wanted just to get a picture. This is a pretty small cherry laurel that he's uprooting here using the leverage of the tool. But what's, uh, what you would see, he might have been able to pull this by hand, but he probably wouldn't have gotten near the roots because it, the uprooter pulls it very slowly and, and tends to end up with a bigger root ball and, and more or less uh, lets us uh, achieve re total removal of the plant so it does not come back. We do use some foliar uh, applications of herbicide, and this is a stock photo that I put in here just because it shows one of the backpack players that sprayers that we usually use. Normally, the only thing that we are attempting to use uh, glyphosate on are some of the ground covers on warm days in the winter, things like the leary oak, perhaps uh, winter creeper, uh, vinca. Uh, we have tried stuff with not much success so far on English ivy, uh, even with a surfactant uh, that we haven't had a lot of success, but we do use a foliar in certain areas. What we've done a lot of in the last few years is a cut stump application where we will cut a tree uh, near the ground and then just put a few drops depending upon the size of the stump to uh, kill the plant I'm using typically Garlon 3A, the active ingredient is, is triclopyr. That's a very, very small one there, but I, I wanted to do one just to have a picture of what we did. We were doing it with trees as two, three, four inches in diameter and having a pretty good success with that. Unfortunately, we got into areas that were so thick with non-native trees that when we cut them down, you couldn't even walk through the forest. It was so littered with 
with this uh, debris. We, in some cases, we hauled it out, but that presents other problems of their own. So what we began doing is more of the uh, hack and squirt or a basal bark application using uh, triclopyr again as the active ingredient, but using either, uh, I think, an element four or a garland four uh, mixed with basal oil. And for hack and squirt, you basically put a hack into the tree or more hacks into the tree and then squirt a bit of the herbicide so that it gets into the cambium layer and travels up and down in the plant uh, and kills it systemically. Uh, obviously, the bigger the tree, the more hacks you use. And you could see all the hacks that were used uh, in that earlier picture with the tree of heaven. You're not trying to girdle the tree. You're trying to keep it alive so it takes all that uh, herbicide and gets it completely in the system and kills it. Uh, hopefully, before it notices what's going on, at least in the case of Tree of Heaven. Um, luckily, we didn't have to invent the wheel on much of this uh, er, uh, application of herbicides. The, uh, there is a management guide for invasive plants in the South, and one of the authors is probably somebody y'all know. Some of you know Stephen Manning, who has a company in. Uh, Nashville that does a lot of work in removing invasive species. They also put on a conference each most years that some of us from the Conservancy have gone to a couple of times, which is extremely uh, educational to go and see how other people are dealing with invasive plants and even other things and animals uh, in, in their uh, areas. On the left is just a, a spreadsheet that we put together, a matrix showing uh, how we, if we can't pull something up, how do we deal with it? And it's very important to know what uh, herbicides to use, the concentration of the herbicide to use, the method of application, and when to do it, because all those are very important uh, in having success in eliminating the plants you want to eliminate, but not impacting other ones. I mentioned that study that Eric bridges reproduced in the summer of 2019, which uh, pretty much mirrored what Dr. Goulden did. But uh, on the left there is an overhead view of, of much of the park with a bunch of green dots, I guess that were generated as points. Using GPS, uh, a team would go to each dot and uh, start pulling some radii from that point, some of the radii pretty large and counting all the trees and species that are in those circles from the large ones to the medium sized ones, even to the very tiny ones. Uh, and luckily, Eric uh, had a lot of had help from some graduate assistants. I helped a few times, but I will tell you that when that point landed in the bunk in the middle of a patch of green briar, uh, it was uh, a painful uh, operation to try to get it all done. My background is engineering and I've sort of loved the uh, science part of different things. And that's also something that intrigued me. Eric is really a scientist. He's a forester. He's, he's doing the uh, huge amount of uh, science and, and discovery on and working on his doctoral degree. And, and that part intrigued me as well. On, on another count that he and I did at one point, we would just basically get on a compass point and walk so many paces and and drop a pin and count species. And he would, he would count and I would write. And that was just one page out of many of, a, of the things we were keeping. But it's very important for us to know what we're dealing with, know what's there and where is it, uh, as well as knowing how our efforts work. I came upon this flag probably two or three years later after we originally put it in. When we were finding kudzu, we would experiment. And, and work on it in different ways, keep notes of what we did, and then uh, flag it so we can hopefully find it again in the future to see the results of our work. And very specifically in a case like that, in some cases we'd find a vine, we would roll it up into a nice little coil and spray it with a foliar and label it and see how that worked. And in other cases we would trace it down and go back to the roots and then dig down and follow the roots for a way until we got to a one of the nodes that are in this plant. Uh, I guess it's a legume 
And then we would kind of scrape that node and apply a different herbicide there. And again, track how we did and how that seemed to work uh, in our process. What we're also learning is I, I talked a little bit about uh, a forest gap where sunshine is introduced and there's succession. Well, here in Overton Park, that succession process has been greatly changed because there are so many invasive plants there that are evergreen and really can outcompete some of the native plants. And it happens in the gaps when we have trees fall, but it also happens on the edges. And Overton Park has probably more edges than a typical 130 acre forest. Some of those edges are major streets. Some of those edges are little minor roads or paths. And a significant number of the edges are along the golf course uh, in Overton Park. So Overton Park is uh, more than just a forest. It's got some great elements that attract a lot of Memphians and people from outside Memphis. We've got a terrific zoo. We have Brooks uh, Art Gallery there. We have an open air shell, the Overton Park shell, which has music venues quite frequently. Uh, there's several playgrounds, a, a big greensward for open play. And we've got this terrific nine hole golf course which has just been reopened after about a year and a half renovation. If you're ever in Memphis and want a fun round of golf, this is the place to do it. But as we were working with the golf renovation, we began kind of understanding a little bit about the, the need to maybe address the edges in a different way. And while we have not done anything yet on our potential list of things that we may want to try is not only removing invasive plants, but potentially planning back some of the natives to give them a little bit of a head start in especially these uh, high sunlight areas that can cause invasives to grow quite quickly. That's something that's uh, uh, on our radar to, to experiment with. Um, I do use herbicides some. The Conservancy required me to be certified to uh, I took a very difficult test a few years ago uh, to, to be able to do that. And I, I'll have to say that I never want to take that test again. So I try to keep my points up. So I keep my certification. But I will tell you that when, you know, we, in the park, there's things that can go wrong. And one of the things that we don't let go wrong is the herbicides. We, it's just absolutely imperative that we read, understand, and follow all the label directions. And I really carry those labels on my phone uh, so that I can uh, uh, assess them, access them uh, as necessary if I need to, because uh, we certainly want to uh, mention before, impact the plants that we want out, but not impact anything else. In the forest are insects that can cause problems, lots of thorns, there's poison ivy. Uh, you can get hot and dehydrated. You can twist an ankle. There's a number of copperheads in this urban park. Uh, I have cut my left hand by operating a handsaw with my right hand, so I've figured out ways to prevent that. Uh, you see uh, down the left-hand corner, that's a, me with a little bit of some scratches on my face from walking through Greenbrier when I wasn't being careful enough. But I guess you'll also see I've got uh, some protective glasses on because in a previous year, I've stuck a stick in my eye, so that's not fun either. Uh, picture on the right there is... Uh, both of my legs were severely impacted by chiggers one time, and that was enough. So I figured out the absolute best practice on preventing that uh, from happening again. Uh, volunteers are the key to the effort uh, here for us in Overton Park. And gee, every face is smiling there after a hard morning of uh, uprooting things in a, on a winter day, but. Uh, we have a lot of fun. That's a wintertime picture. You see a lot of brown in the forest behind there, but you also see some green in that picture. And that green, uh, it's at least in part cherry laurel, maybe some cherry laurel as well as some uh, privet back there. Uh, but volunteers are a key. And throughout the uh, cooler months, we have very regular uh, volunteer events where we can uh, begin to impact the invasives in different sections of the forest. This is the future of the effort. Um, again, a wintertime photo, uh, not too much green growth in the background, which is most of what this forest looks like, except for maybe some 
uh, American holly, or perhaps if it's not too cold, you might see a few leaves from some uh, coral honeysuckle there. But this is a group of scouts. And scouts are now our secret weapon on eradicating English ivy from the forest. We began using some of them about three years ago, not knowing how it would work out. But even though the area is not huge that they will clear, it has a long lasting effect. The areas they cleared three years ago are still clear of ivy. So uh, if we can't find an appropriate uh, foliar, uh, then uh, uh, this is what really, really works. And I love this picture because it's it really, it's, it's a pretty diverse group of all the folks that uh, are contributing to uh, eliminating, reducing, the invasive plants in Oberlin Park, and it's a very much of a learning experience, especially for the kids, and they uh, do a, a phenomenal amount of work. I gave this presentation to a retiree group where I, uh, from Memphis Light, Gas, and Water, and when I got to this slide, I asked everybody who had heard of Doug Tallamy to raise their hand. And I, I think one person out of about 50 did. I, I was a little disappointed, but at least I was happy I was able to at least put this name in, in, in their brains and maybe get them to go look at it a little bit. But I, I would suspect many of you are very familiar with the work of Doug Tallamy. But uh, if, if you haven't read or looked at one of his uh, presentations on YouTube, I, I strongly encourage you to do so and encourage others to do so because it is very eye-opening uh, to give us the uh, uh, value of native plants uh, in our ecosystem. A number of people uh, asked me why I do what I do and how, I, and, and I kind of mentioned my mom who really got me into that. And I saw this quote just not long ago and it's from a, uh, a Native American, Stan Rushworth, uh, and it talks about more, we have, I feel like more so than I have rights, I really have obligations. And, and when I'm, I can go out and have work uh, my part to do a little bit here in Memphis and Overton Park to, to make the uh, ecosystem a little bit better, uh, I like to do that. And my, my wife will tell you that in the last few years, I have been planting natives like crazy in our yard. She's on board with that as well. And we actually have a great deal of fun with that. And that is the conclusion uh, of my presentation. So uh, I'll kick it back to you, uh, Neil or uh, Alyssa. Thank you, Bill. That was... Um... Very exciting. We've got quite a lot of questions in the chat, if I can pull them up. Um, I'm gonna kind of group them by categories. So let's see. Okay, about the hack and squirt, which season is best for the hack and squirt method? Growing season uh, is best for certainly for, uh, for a, a tree of heaven, it's gotta be sometime in the growing season. And typically when we find them, we just, do them then because it's hard to find them when they're not in leaf, uh, at least it is for me. Uh, I've done cherry laurels in the winter time. And what I've found is it's a slower process, but it still can work. Summertime, heavy growing system seems to be the best. Okay. And how long does it take for the hack and squirt method chemical to take effect? I have seen some trees show major effects in a week. Uh, some of the cherry laurels will take many weeks. Gotcha. Um, what is the surfactant used with the chemicals? Um, we typically buy Roundup Pro that has a surfactant already in it, and I'm not sure what surfactant is in Roundup Pro. Okay. It would be on the label. Um... Where did this question go? Oh yes, did Overton Park have any water features that required special care? Uh, there is a man-made concrete uh, lake in a portion of the park, but it is far from the forested area that we deal with. There are water conveyances through the park, 
So we are careful in pesticide application to make sure that we're following the directions on the different pesticides we use if we might be near a water conveyance. Most of those are typically dry unless it's raining. Gotcha. Um, another question about the park itself. How did the goals of the golf course conflict or support the goals of the conservancy? That's a great question. Uh, there, uh, in, the, in the form of golf course, you want lots of sunlight. Uh, so they would love to keep a lot of trees away from tees and greens and fairways. Uh, and so there was, there was some sacrifice of trees, but the trees typically taken were not in the old forest and that they weren't the state natural area. They were more in or along the edge of the golf course area. So, so there's, there was some uh, disagreement there, but it was a, a, there, I think compromise was reached and everybody has been happy with that. Uh, the, the golf course also would like to have beautiful vistas looking into the forest. And when you looked in and saw a tangle of, uh, uh, of trees and vines and things like that, they would like that cleaned up if possible. And in many cases we were able to do it. And that's what we spent a lot of time doing because most of that was invasive and it kind of changed our priorities on some of the areas that we were hitting. And so when they started working on the golf course, we began hitting some of the golf course edges. And I mentioned cutting down large trees. We took down hundreds of cherry laurels in one area that were probably between three and five inches in diameter and hauled them out. And they actually, in the golf course process, they dug huge pits. And we just basically buried them in the pits so that we didn't have to have them in the forest, but we didn't have to deal with them in any other way. And that was uh, something that worked pretty well. Gotcha. Okay, the next two questions are asking you to divulge some secrets. Uh, one is, can you share your invasive plant treatment spreadsheets? Yes, uh, certainly. It's no better than what's in that USDA book, but it's, it is kind of a, a one-stop shop for the, at least the invasives we work on. I put that together a couple of years ago, so it's... Uh, uh, Absolutely, and I guess basically you can share my contact information with anybody who wants that, uh, and I'll be glad to send them my spreadsheet. Okay. Um, and then how did you prevent the sugar attacks? <laughs> so I now uh, wear clothing with, uh, I think the brand is probably Insect Shield, but it's permethrin. Uh, I got some pretty rugged pants that I wear, shirts, socks, uh, and uh, uh, that seems to do the trick. I, I wore kind of muck type boots for a while, but they're horrible to walk in. So I just went back to my high top hiking boots and I haven't had any chigger tick or any issues in several years. That's awesome. Um, do you have any volunteer sessions in the park scheduled for this fall? Absolutely. Um, we, I, I basically, I've uh, sort of our, uh, our old person group of, uh, on, on Friday mornings, we basically get together every Friday morning and it will go three hours if we can stand it. Uh, and that'll start certainly after the leaves begin to fall and then we'll go all till the following spring until we can't stand it anymore. And then we'll, we'll have bigger events that we'll get the Conservancy to announce uh, typically on a Saturday or Sunday where we'll get more and more people in and begin uh, just that bigger, a bigger event working on whatever uh, uh, we choose to or the area that we choose to work in at the time. So if uh, someone's interested, again, they can contact me and I'm happy to share all that with them because the more volunteers, the better. Uh, or if you follow the Overton Park Conservancy, uh, they will post the bigger events that happen as well. Okay. Um, and then last question before we turn it back over to Neil to kind of wrap up and, and talk about next month's webinar. Um, how would you define long-term success for this project? That's probably the best question. Um, I think we can eliminate 
some invasives that just really haven't been addressed for many, many decades. But I think success is having a more appropriately, uh, the, the succession process more appropriate in the forest as it probably was in the past. And to do that, we will continue to have to work on species like privet all the time. I have a hope that we actually, once we can get English ivy down, that we can probably say goodbye to that at some point. When that might be, I don't know. Um, but I think it's uh, success. You know, and I'll say the other part of that is I think about success is that, and that slide with all the young people you saw, when all those young people step up and they begin doing the same thing and understanding that. And with, with a lot of people who are involved and interested, I think we can really have a significant successful impact on trying to keep this old oak hickory forest uh, as close to its uh, the way it's been for the few last few thousand years as possible. Gotcha. Well, thank you very much. Neil, do you want to take over for a minute? I'm going to share this yeah. screen. Um, yeah, and I don't, I don't want to uh, move on to the next item without making a few comments and thanking Bill for what I thought was a, a practical uh, presentation that has application throughout the state. And I, I might add one more success, Bill, uh, to what y'all have done there is that, and that is that you have shown us a template and a process uh, that we can use anywhere in Tennessee or beyond. And the reason I think that's important is that many of us, well, a lot of folks aren't even aware of the invasive plant problem, but for those of us that are, it's very overwhelming in knowing what to do. And we need to hear success stories like Overton Park uh, that can inspire us and maybe guide, guide us to replicate what y'all have done there. Thank you. And I might, I, one thing I didn't point out is at one point, a few decades ago, the uh, the interstate was going to go right through the middle of Overton Park, and it's now a uh, required learning in law classes across the land now because that uh, got very very far along, but it was stopped. It was determined that that was an inappropriate thing to happen, and I think luckily for all of us, uh, the the park has uh, stayed uh, as a whole with a great forest and all the other tenants that are there. Super. Well, okay. Well, I don't. Y'all may have remembered, uh, but Bill mentioned Dr. Talamy, and uh, he has several excellent books out. But uh, we did have as a presenter last year Dr. Desiree Narango. She was a uh, doctoral student under Doug Talamy, and actually some of her research towards her uh, doctorate was cited in his book, and that had to do with tree selection, native trees to attract pollinators and songbirds. So if you wanna learn more about what trees do best, native trees do best to enhance our pollinators and songbirds, ties into what Bill's talking about. Uh, we have that presentation archived uh, uh, for your enjoyment. Okay, so uh, last thing, uh, if you need CEUs, didn't register, send your CEU certification number via the chat room and we will handle that for you. We're gonna make sure that you stayed with us throughout the entire program before we send your name in, but we appreciate you uh, doing that. And um, we have a presentation next month, uh, kind of moving from topic to topic. This is a, uh, uh, Bill, you know this guy right here, Wes Hopper. I uh, sure do. With him, uh, but Wes is gonna be our speaker next, next month. And he's gonna talk about actually homeowners or tree owners' rights and responsibilities. And this is going to be kind of a practical look at some of the legal rights uh, that homeowners have to care for their tree and how to resolve conflicts and, and disagreements and uh, misunderstandings about whose responsibility it is to care for their tree and, uh, and what steps they can take. So that should be a very good presentation. Hope you can join us on Thursday, September 15th at 11 a.m. Central Time. All right.
So, um, Elisa, do we have if that's it on your end and Bill on yours? Uh, I want to thank everybody for sitting into this very informative webinar, and we look forward to having you join us next month. Thank you.